put together a list of 21 individuals who you would like to work with either as a customer, a client, or a strategic partner, and then do some research on those individuals. Like support you in that mission, and so it allows you to... Ex because you want to think about it, if you can give your attendees a win before through your company so that business owners can actually make sure that you know we can all learn from that because essentially welcome everyone to another episode of event gems i am here with melissa p dunn commissioner of lauder hill owner of md marketing network i am so excited we're going to be talking today about relationship is a currency how to increase your reach with strategic collaborations hey melissa thanks for joining hey, Melissa. Uh, thank you for having me on your show i'm super excited i wanted to talk to you more about strategic relationships and relationships as a currency uh so my first question to you is you know how do you go about like cultivating and nurturing relationships because i think as we go into the new year and we start out the first quarter a lot of people might be thinking about you know some new things that they want to do or get into a new level uh so can you talk a bit about you know how do you go about nurturing relationships to help you uh build your business um or or build out any projects that you might be working on Listen, I can't, I mean, the topic of the show, relationship is currency. That is such a powerful and true statement. I have planned a whole event <laughs> based on the strength of relationships. I mean, if you think about it, the return to work job fair was built strictly on relationships yes, and strategic exactly. partnerships. Um, and so really my strategy is to identify key individuals that have the skill sets that I need in order to move projects forward for my client. So whether it's events, a virtual event planner like you, the Diamond Butterfly, so you're a part of my strategic um, group and, mm -hmm. you know, somebody who loves PR. And so a lot of times when you get, for me as an agency, when I get large contracts, there are some parts of the work that I do myself mm -hmm. and there's some parts of the work that it makes sense to outsource. And so I have chosen to build my agency around strategic partnerships so that people who perhaps have the skill sets that I have too, but that's not mm -hmm. my passion, I bring mm -hmm. them to the table there's more than enough for everyone to eat, right? Mm -hmm. So the key to really creating strategic partnerships, I think really starts with your mindset. You have to believe that it's possible to create win-win scenarios with individuals or organizations, right? So you have to already go into it with a mindset that we can all win, with a mindset that there's more than enough for everyone to, to shine. There's more than enough for everyone to win. So that's the first step is your mind step. The second step is for you to be clear about what your intentions are for that partnership. So in my case, when we were planning the return to work job fair, my clear intention was for me to create an opportunity to put people back to work. And so I had to look at the skill sets that we needed in order to get that done. And so that's how I chose which partner to go after. And then the third thing is really being clear about your, your core value. You want to make sure that the partners that you select are in alignment with your values. So for me, I value a certain type of work, work ethic, right? My tagline has always been get it done. And so for me, the right partner is someone who's going to do what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it. They're loyal, they're dependable, and above all, they value putting out exceptional work for the community. And so when I choose a partner, I make sure that they are in alignment with my values. And then, of course, um, the fourth piece is making sure that you negotiate an agreement that you all can feel good about. Um, I believe, you know, as a, as a conscious capitalist, I believe that business could be a tool for social good, right? And so whenever I negotiate a partnership agreement, I make sure that yes, I win, but I want my partner to win too. And I want our customers to win as well. So make sure that you negotiate an agreement. That's a win-win for everyone. And then, of course, the fifth and final step is execute. Mm. 
I love it. I love it. Um, and I think like that event really was, I, I, I think maybe you started planning it a month and a, a month and a half in advance or so. And the way mm -hmm. that everything came together, I was super impressed. The amount of people that were, you know, a part of the team um, who all came together to support you. And like you said, they all had uh, different skill sets or they all, you know, were accomplished in, you know, their particular field. And then they all came together to make the event a success. So I think that that's such an important um, part of what you were talking about is identify people who have the skill sets that you need um, or that you might not be passionate about. And I also love that you drill down on the core values, uh, making sure that persons who um, you align with or you, you know you collaborate with you know do share your core values and uh then the third of course is really around like that win-win factor that you talk about um and i love that you talk about ca conscious capitalism i think that you know um that needs to get more shine in the marketplace so where you can negotiate contracts or negotiate um collaborations where everyone wins and so i think that that is such an important point so thank you for that and then so can you talk about because right now we are in we are still amid a, a pandemic and we're dealing with COVID. Um, so can you talk about how you were able to build those relationships or how can someone build those relationships um, in a virtual world or in a virtual space? Because um, I know, you know, right now there's not, not a lot of networking events for people to go to um, or, you know, conferences and things like that where a lot of business owners might be able to collaborate or connect with other people. So can you talk about um, some ways in which people can do that in the virtual space? The old fashioned way. Pick up the phone. <laughs> really. The old, I said the old fashioned way. Pick up the phone. <laughs> Make the call. Talk to people. Reach out to them on social media to see how you can be of service, right? Um, and you're right. The key to that is is obviously building the relationship. So if you're looking to do it cold, I find that social media is a great place to start. So I have this tactic called my dream 100 list, which is something that I learned from Russell Brunson, who, as you guys probably know, is a huge sales funnel guy. And he has this process that I learned from him called Dream 100, which is where you put your list together of 100 people that would be your dream clients, your dream strategic partners. And then you really start to strategically put yourself in a position to make connections with those individuals. So I would say, get your list, your dream 100 list, or perhaps for you, your dream 20 list or 2021 list, since we're going into a new year, put together a list of 21 individuals who you would like to work with either as a customer, a client, or a strategic partner, and then do some research on those individuals. Find out who in your network is already connected to them. Perhaps ask for a um, ask for a virtual introduction and schedule a time for you to have coffee together virtually, right? I've had plenty of coffee dates. And in fact, I have sometimes done like a happy hour um, virtually, right? So you can really get a chance to get to know that person. So if that person is on a board of directors or involved with a charity, then get involved with that organization yourself. Remember, you're not a vulture, right? You're not going in to only take, you're also going into the relationship to give. After all, abundance is a cycle of giving and receiving. So you wanna make sure that you put yourself in a position where you can make a real meaningful connection and offer to help them promote their product and service offer to help them support their charity, right? And then, you know, start start from there. Go into it with the intention of giving. Yeah, I think that that's such an important point. And I was actually speaking to a friend of mine yesterday talking about volunteering and how that's such a great way to make connections. Um, and I, th I think for me, like I have made some amazing connections just like volunteering or um, working with other persons and not necessarily like expecting like there to be an immediate um, financial return on anything. Standpoint doesn't necessarily have to be like a financial reward to it, but it's really about like the abundance cycle and the karmic cycle as well, the giving and receiving part of it. Um, so I think that you know what you spoke about really um, drove that home um, in terms of how to utilize or or to make those connections um, with your relationships. And then uh, I did when when I was 
went onto your website and I was reading the description about the biz your business and you know companies that you work with one of the things that you you had on there is that um, you like to work with organizations and companies um, that make it who believe that it is possible to do good and make money. Um, so can you talk about why is that important? Because I think it also ties into what you spoke about earlier around core values. Why is it important for us to work with organizations, partner with other people who um, who who share our core values? And, and, and I know that as a coach, can you talk about how we can even identify and get to our core values? So, you know, understanding your core values is so critical to your success. It's a really, um, your core values is the thing that really connects for you on the inside. It is what drives you. So it could be love, impact, money, whatever it is, but what you, you need to ask yourself, what is it that truly, truly, truly makes you feel happy um, and feel like you're living a purposeful life? Once you understand what those values are, then you make choices in your personal and your professional that aligns with those values, right? So for me, one of my core value is kindness and another one is loyalty and so i always make um make decisions so that i am really fully in alignment with those values um now as an organization remember i said that your core values you take it with you in your personal and your professional life and that's such a key important thing for a ceo right because remember as a ceo whether you're the CEO of your household or the CEO of your business, you bring yourself to that role. And so once you're clear about your core values, then you make sure that your professional choices are in alignment with that. So I consider myself to be a conscious capitalist. And there is like a whole movement out there about conscious capitalism. I actually learned about the concept from listening to a the book out there called Conscious Capitalism. And basically what Conscious Capitalism says is that business can be a tool for social change. Companies like Starbucks, companies like Costco, they are all considered conscious capitalists because they have a really strong corporate social responsibility program and policy. They actually reinvest a portion of their profit back into the community. And as a conscious capitalist, you negotiate um, or set up your business in a way so that it creates a win-win for everyone. You do, you have really great policies to take care of your employees, you take care of the communities that you do business with, and you take care of your vendors as well as your customers, right? So it is a win-win dynamic. And in addition to that, you're able to do good and make money. You don't have to choose, right? Uh, the companies out there who say profit first and they only care about profits, they don't care about people, that's not the right type of client for me. The right type of customer for me, both in my coaching practice and in my advertising agency, is a business or an individual that understands that they themselves can be the change that we need to see in the world. And they bring their whole self into, into that process and you know they create a win-win for everybody. Do good and make money. Yes, I love that. And I definitely feel like right now we're moving into that space um, where more and more um, we are thinking about like, how can we make money, but also do good. And so if you guys don't know about conscious capitalism, or you've never heard of conscious capitalism before, then I highly recommend that you go and check out any books or articles that might be out there about that. Um, and those are some really, really great points that you shared, Melissa. Kind of like take a step back and, and go back to, you know, those first moments of actually planning an event. Because I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, they might be, they want to plan an event. They know that it's a great opportunity for them to showcase their skills, uh, uh, expand their brands, but they're afraid of doing it or, or, or even taking that first step. Can you talk about what your experience was planning your first event or working on your first event? And also talk about the importance of, of, of business owners actually 
producing or curating my own events? Well, I'll talk to you about planning my first festival solo. I mean, you know, before I started my own business, I worked at Circle Home Marketing, and there was a lady there called Martha Bradshaw, who was for me the quintessential event planner. Everything that I know about events, about the structure, the pre-planning, and the organization, really, I learned at Marva's feet. And so, you know, I had the opportunity while working at the Circle to watch how they cultivate jazz in the gardens and other. Um, other large scale festivals. And so my very first solo, like I'm the only person responsible for producing this festival and marketing it and booking talent and all of that stuff came from the Taste of Lauderdale Lake event. Actually it was an event that I developed the concept for, pitched it to the city. They said, yes, we went to contract now i had to make it happen right and the very first thing was to be clear about the intention stephen covey talks about in his book he talks about beginning with the end in mind and i think that's really the same thing for events you got to be clear about the end result that you want whether it's um you know in attendance and ticket sales in a, an experience that you want to create you have to really be very clear about that and then kind of develop the concept for the event out of that. And I actually believe it's important to pitch it to a couple of people who are in your target demographic. And if you're excited about it, then go for it. And of course, planning, planning, planning. I can't tell you enough about the importance of pre-planning and handling all the details well in advance because I guarantee you on the day of, things are going to pop up that you will need to focus on handling. I absolutely agree. It's like Murphy's law. <laughs> I think, you it know, really as much is. as you plan, um, you certainly, there's always going to be something that might not have gone the way that you planned it exactly. And so you have to like, um, to pivot on the fly or, or deal with that in the moment. And so you really don't want to get too stressed out by it. Just know, th but you know, that's a great point is that, you know, in advance that there's probably going to be something. So you're kind of prepared and you give yourself enough room and enough space for if that that does happen, then at least you have time to deal with it as opposed to um, being behind on the schedule or being behind on the things that you need to do. And then now you're trying to you know, deal with this other thing, this monkey wrench that has now like uh, reared its head in your plan. So yes, I think that that is absolutely true. So Melissa, can you leave us with one or two event gems? or let's say, leave us with one or two gems, right? Um, it could be event related or personal related, you know, anything, let us know um, what you'd like for us to, to, to be left with as we powerfully step into the new year. Well, the, the first gem really is to spend some time getting to know who you are. Really take a time and identify your core values and then look at your life and your business to see if they're in alignment. And if they're not, take the necessary step to get into alignment because I really believe that people who, I mean, we have people who are multimillionaires that are completely unhappy. Mm -hmm. Then we have people who are dirt poor who are completely happy, right? So we know that happiness is not... Um, linked to money. It's really your mindset that makes all the difference in the world. And if you're out of alignment with your core values, whether it's in your personal life or your business life, then that's going to affect your quality of life. So my recommendation, my suggestion to you is to go ahead and identify your core values. Take an hour, get a piece of paper and just write on there random words that really connect with you in terms of a way of being, the way that you want to show up in the world, the way that's important to you. And then number that list from one to six and identify your top six. And those really are the ones that you want to make sure that you're in complete alignment with. Once you do that, I guarantee you, your happiness quotient will go up. So take the time and identify your four values. And most importantly of all, be kind and loving to yourself because you deserve it. 
Yes, I absolutely agree. Thank you so much, Melissa, for being here and sharing with us today on Event Gems. I appreciate you for everything that you do. I appreciate you for who you are and you know who you are in my life. So I just wanted to acknowledge you for that. And we didn't even talk about you being a commissioner. Is there anything that you have planned that you'd like to talk about on the show today? There are a couple of things that we have planned. I just, within the first 30 days of being elected, launched a program called Lottie Hill Shine which is a virtual um, platform where new businesses in the city of Lauder Hill will learn skills like marketing events. In fact, you, the Diamond Butterfly, are one of those strategic partners yeah. that I called on to help me to put that course together. I mean, if you think about it, right, that is really a relationship currency because we have, I think, perhaps more than 10 mm -hmm. modules a uh, skill set being taught by professionals, and that's really based on my relationship. Had mm -hmm. we needed to pay everybody, that course in itself could have cost thousands of dollars to produce. Um, and since we didn't have the budget to get it done, I called on my relationship. And so that currency helped to Came produce a product yes. that's going to be beneficial to business owners in the city of Lauder Hill. Absolutely. Oh my absolutely. gosh, I can see it. Tie that together. Yeah, tie it all together. <laughs> That's what we love here. And it's so funny because I, you know, like immediately when, once you said that all I kept thinking about is the whole thing that's happening on social media with the guy who's talking about where the money resides where the money resides <laughs> so I'm kind of like relationships is where the money resides okay so just really think about that as a currency uh, thank you so much Melissa once again for being here with us um, guys check out the next episode next week new episodes dropping every Monday so I'll see you soon bye bye, bye. support you in that mission and so it allows you to ex because you want to think about it if you can give your attendees a win before or through your company so that business owners can actually matter that you know we can all learn from that because essentially